Okay, hi, and uh, welcome to the review for the new Behringer Eurodesk. That is the SX2442 FX, and the FX at the end designates that it's got these two onboard 24 bit FX processors, right? Now, um, they had a model with the same name before, but as far as I remember, it was finished in a sort of silvery white, all over like this kind of silvery white. Um, I never used it, I've never even seen one in real life, and I have no idea, therefore, whether this new version has added any technical changes or f added any new features or anything like that. But it's changed visually, okay? And now the mixer is finished in this kind of gunmetal satin grey. And um, other parts of the board are picked out in this kind of black and silvery white paint. And I must say that it works very well in terms of light. You can very... By the way they've like used different colour backgrounds for different parts of the mixer, it makes it really simple to quickly go to different sections of the board. And on a compact board that's, that's quite important, uh, that you don't get visual cluttering, you know. So, in that respect, it works very well. Um, OK, I just want to show you something up at the top here, look. You put a right angle plug in there and you can push the mixer back against the wall and you get enough space at the front on a standard 60 centimetre work surface to put a keyboard across the front there and things. Um, in terms of the width, it's 26.9 inches wide and it will in fact fit into a 27 inch gap pretty much exactly. Uh, so it's, it's a very compact mixer. Um, with a very small footprint, uh, but a lot of features, man. I'm telling you, I, I, the more I've got into this mixer, I, it's it's surprisingly well featured, and it's good that it's small because obviously your typical MIDI studio uh, it, it has very little space available. Usually, it's usually a bedroom studio or something, and um, also for live PA use, um, you know, PA equipment has become more and more compact over the years, and um, a small footprint but fully featured mixer means that when you put it in the flight case it's still going to be fairly small and you can potentially then get your whole PA rig in the back of a hatchback or um, or, a, or an estate car or something, right? And you don't want to have to buy a van, do you really? Unless you're running a really big rig, you know. So, yeah, it's good um, in all those respects. Um, okay, before we start, I just want to say that uh, when I do these uh, videos for Dance Tech, I don't... Um, I don't like to do the kind of just a basic walkthrough saying uh, it's got 16 mic inputs, it's got uh, three band British EQ and four auxiliaries and all the rest of it and just do it like that because beginners are not going to have a clue what you're talking about. Okay, um, And people who are more experienced, to be honest, could read the specs off the internet and look at a few pictures and pretty much work out what it'll do. Um, if you want to see a quick walkthrough explaining or showing the features and also showing how the routing works in the master section and stuff but without any explanations for beginners I've put two videos up on YouTube right they're 10 minutes each one looks at the inputs and one looks at the master section so if you are experienced and just want to walk through the routing and things um, just look at those right but this is the more in-depth version and it's for beginners so as I go through the board and walk through it bit by bit as I come to each feature of the board, I will explain briefly for beginners what it does and what it means and stuff like that. So this is a walkthrough and a review in terms of I'll give my opinion uh, as we go. And it also will kind of almost double as a little primer tutorial for beginners in some respects as well. OK, so it's going to be a bit of a long haul. Um, and it's a shame I don't have a better microphone voice because it would probably make it easier for a longer video listening to a much nicer voice. But I don't have a great mic voice to be honest, so tough I'm afraid. Um, but bear with me and uh, let's launch into it. Okay, now there's the mixer. It is a 24 into 4 into 2. What does that mean? Well, for beginners, that means you've got 24 input channels going into four subgroups, going into two, and two is your final left-right stereo master fader. Okay, So 24 channels into four into two. 
And uh, Behringer delivers those channels to you um, like every other mixer manufacturer does it nowadays. You get 24 channels and they deliver those 24 channels to you by giving you 16 uh, what I would call fully featured channels that have a mic preamp. Okay, that gives you your first 16 channels. They then augment those 16 channels by adding on additional fixed stereo line input channels. And for beginners, a fixed stereo line input channel is a single physical strip, channel strip, but it's carrying a stereo signal through it, whereas mic channels with a mic or line input are mono. Okay, They carry a mono signal. And by adding these single physical channel strips that are carrying a stereo signal, that allows mixers and manufacturers to give you more channels for less space. So 16 fully featured mic channels, then you've got two full length fixed stereo line channels, that's 17, 18 and 19, 20. And then the last two stereo line channels, 21, 22 and 23, 24, are like these little mini channels. And all they have is a level input control auxiliaries 1 and 2 and a solo switch with an accompanying LED lamp and that's your 24 channels. Um, so let's have a look at one of the uh, fully featured mic input equipped channels right so here we go right and there we are at the top of the channel. And it begins at the top with an XLR microphone input socket, which is emblazoned with the legend Xenix Mic Preamp. And uh, Behringer makes quite a lot of these Xenix Mic Preamps in their literature. But what you need to know about them is that they have got this 130 dB of dynamic range and 60 dB of boost or gain and therefore they will handle pretty much anything you chuck at them right and that's all you need to know and in fact interestingly 130 dB of dynamic range 60 dB of um, gain is exactly the same spec as the Mackie VLZ so uh, the other thing is um, these, these, these XLR inputs are held in place with little Phillips head screws or bolts here and that's good because um, if you go for the long haul um, and you need to change a faulty XLR socket the potential to do that is, is, is much better than if these have been riveted in, you know what I mean? And uh, while we've got the camera here, you can quite clearly see the gold flickering inside those socket connectors here. All the XLR inputs are gold-plated connectors, as are the master left-right balanced XLR outs. But I think I'm correct in saying that all the quarter-inch connectors on this board are not gold-plated, OK? If I'm wrong, someone correct me, but I don't think I am. So that's your XLR input and then um, after that you have a balanced or unbalanced tip ring sleeve quarter inch line input and then you have a tip ring sleeve insert in out socket. Now, um, Behringer have had to cut costs somewhere. Uh, it's a 325 British pounds mixer with a lot of features so they've had to cut costs somewhere and you know what you don't get is you don't get direct outs on these channels. But uh, beginners might not know this, but um, if you are a quarter inch plug up in a certain way, you can plug it into an insert socket and take a direct out without disturbing the signal coming down the channel. And um, so therefore it is possible to plug 16 mics into this and by wiring up 16 leads with a jack plug wired the right way at one end, you could potentially take 16 directs out direct outs from these mic channels and record 16 mics at once into a 16 channel recorder or 16 inputs on a Mac or PC. Okay, they're not true direct outs when, they're when, when you're doing it like that, but it does work. Um, and that is your inputs, yeah? And then we're into the, um, the channel controls, which begin at the top with these input gain controls, and um, these are capped in white, okay? Now, they've got these little calibration marks at the bottom there, these little printed numbers, yeah? And if you really want to get into it, Behringer gives instructions in the booklet 
about how to use those marks to calibrate your inputs to mic and line levels and stuff. But for the everyday average user, the thing that you need to know, apart from the fact they'll handle anything you chuck at them, is that they've got this rather nice level set trim yellow LED indicator lamp, right? And it's and it works really, really well actually. I'll just show you that. I've got a, I've got a drum machine coming in here. And this is the kick drum channel. If I raise the kick drum up until I get a nice healthy flickering on that level set trim indicator, right? Then I go down the channel, raise the fader here to zero. Right, there it is. Now for beginners, if a fader is raised to zero, the signal coming through it is not boost boosted or cut. It passes through pretty much as is, right? Right, we'll punch that channel into the main left right. And go over to the main left right here and I'll raise this to zero and look at what happens on the meters. Yeah. It's peaking comfortably at four. With a with a fairly nominal flickering on that LED. Okay, if I boost it a little bit more hot, but it's still not overloading or anything. Come back here, raise that to zero. And you can see it's now peaking at seven. Now um, LED, these LED ladder meters have a final LED pair that are, that are called clip. And basically, what you do is you'd calibrate your bus outputs or your subgroup outputs here, um, and your master output and what have you to your to match your inputs on your digital recorder or Mac or PC. And the point I'm making is if you then if you've got everything set so that these meters match the inputs on your Mac or PC, um, it's it's a, just so easy to get a nominal, good, healthy level through the board. You just you just adjust this until it flickers nicely, and um, you know you get a signal arriving at your outputs that's that's nice and hot, but but comfortably uh, safe under under clip, and and you get a nice balanced level through the board. And in that respect, this is a really nice uh, feature. I like it a lot. And especially in live gigs, you know, it makes it a snip to set up channels, you know, make sure you've got a signal coming in and stuff like that. Um, okay, that's your um, input gain control. And um, on the mic channels, every one of the uh, 16 mic channels has got accompanying the gain control. It's got this, um, this low cut switch, which is a classical low cut mic rumble switch. Uh, and by that I mean it's uh, fixed at 80 hertz and it cuts by 18 dB octave. That's the slope of the cut, right? Which is a traditional mic low rumble cut switch. And you get one on every mic channel. And that's a bonus uh, for live use, but of course in the studio if you've got uh, you're, you're using a cheap um, large diaphragm condenser mic or something, you know, um, you can use, and it doesn't have its own low cut switch built into the mic, you've got a low cut switch on every mic channel. Anyway, it's a, it's a good bonus. So that's your inputs. And then we are into the EQ section. And uh, the EQ section is finished in these navy blue coloured caps, apart from the frequency selector for the sweet mid, which is slightly lighter blue, so that you can easily see that's the frequency from a, from a normal distance away. Now, um, this is a three band EQ with a sweep mid, although Behringer says that um, in the literature that it's a semi parametric mid. But um, they make a lot in the literature and on the box and everything about this EQ and they call it British EQ. Yes, uh, you know, cabbage grates over the briny old boy, Dundee cakes on the Piccadilly line, don't you know, boy of what? British EQ. Yes. Um, that's all very well, isn't it? I mean, to be honest, if it was modern British EQ, it would, it would be called Chav EQ. And uh, when you went to adjust something, it would jump out and stab you or set its pit bull on you or something, you know what I mean? <laughs> no, no, seriously, British EQ, yes, it's all very neural coward, isn't it? Oh, very British EQ, well, boy, don't you know? Well, what does it mean, British EQ? Oh, crikey, I, don't, I mean, to be honest, it, it doesn't really mean anything. It's a bit of marketing hyperbole, to be honest, but... Um, uh, British EQ, if it means, or if it ever meant anything at all, just meant that in the old days, I mean, you know, back in the 60s and stuff, British console manufacturers tended to, um, they, 
if you had a bass control on a British EQ and you boosted it or whatever, it boosted a nice wide warm band of frequencies. It wasn't sort of tight and narrow and boosted the bass in a little sort of narrow. Um, and British EQ had a nice warm low mid and everything and and the frequencies they chose uh, were not like sort of 1k and 10k and kind of almost decimally chosen frequencies. Uh, they they chose frequencies that um, were known as musical frequencies for the for the filters on their EQ. You know, for the um, for the for the frequencies. Um, I mean, that's all it means if it means anything at all. It's just warm and musical, right? Well. What does it sound like? Um, well, to be honest, it, 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 again, it's a three hundred and twenty-five pound board, and, and you've got sixteen very nice, um, very nice little mic preamps, which are nice and silent, and tons of range and everything, and very smooth. And the EQ is pretty much the same. I mean, it's 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 smooth, it's it's warm, it's musical in inverted commas. You know, it's it's nice. It's it's perfectly fine. Um, again, the EQ is the same specs as on the Mackie VLZ. Uh, you've got a 12k top, cut or boost 15 dB. You have got a 80 hertz bass, cut or boost by 15 dB. And then you've got this sweet mid. And you can select a centre frequency between 100 hertz and 8 kilohertz, and cut or boost that selected centre frequency by 15 dB. Okay. Now uh, it sounds all nice, you know, and everything, and uh, it doesn't. The CQ doesn't sort of jump out and go boo at you, you know what I mean? Um, you choose a frequency on the mid and you boost it and it's very subtle at first with a very slight wide, fairly wide curve boost, but very subtle and the more you boost it, it, it seems to audibly sort of peak a little bit more, you know, like it, like as if it's tightening up a bit, you know, uh, which kind of is what sweep EQs do. Um, Behringer actually calls this a semi-parametric mid and I actually had to look that up because I've never heard anyone use that that term and I thought maybe the Yanks um, used the term for something we Brits call something different, you know. Um, but I mean I've never heard anyone refer to a semi-parametric EQ. I know these as a sweep EQ and they do have that quality of slight, slightly tightening up the more you boost them. Now there's nothing in the literature to explain the curves that Behringer have, have chosen for these. I mean you, you know the frequencies and the cut and boost amount but uh, I thought just to make this review slightly more interesting than your average, what I did was I recorded some white noise uh, which I passed through a channel or a pair of channels and I recorded it into WaveLab. And what I did was I, I chose th uh, three different um, frequencies for the mid and then I put the white noise through it and I started by having it flat, no boost at all, then I boosted it uh, to about 2 o'clock, then I boosted it to about three o'clock and then I boosted it to full boost at five o'clock and I recorded that into WaveLab and I'm going to use the spectrum meter uh, just to show you those curves in action right so let's start there we go. you can see what I recorded there right and uh, what happens is here it is coming along and then I apply the first amount of boost here that's like two o'clock then I push it up to about three four o'clock then full boost here for this last big hump that's a full boost and let's see what the curves do, right? I think the first one was at about, I don't know, 3k or something, but here we go. There's the meter, right? So let's see it play. Okay, so uh, what frequency are we here? 5k or something? No boost at the moment. Here comes the first amount of boost. Here it comes. Okay, so we seem to be about 2k, 2.5k around here. There you can see it's a nice gentle curve. Here comes the second level of boost, about 3 o'clock. And you can see the 2.5k pushing up. Still, it's a nice curve, but the middle is a bit more high. And now here comes full boost. And you see how the middle pushes right up, but the edges proportionately are not pushing up as much. When it drops, you'll see the little things drop down, and you see how they drop down to a more smooth, wide curve. OK, let's look at, um, I think this boost over here is at 8k. Here we go. So, here we go. No boost at all at first. Right, here comes the first, here's the signal, and we're at about 8k here now. Right, first boost, it's a nice smooth curve. Here comes the 3 o'clock boost, and it's 
peaking up but the curve is still quite smooth. Now here comes full boost and see how the middle frequency, the centre frequency pushes up and it becomes steeper. Yeah. So you know that's pretty much how you hear the EQ to be honest. Um, let me just stop that. That's, that's kind of how you perceive it when you use it to be honest. I mean uh, you know I haven't got a full mix of anything coming through here but you know. You um, let's use this snare. Uh, you choose a frequency like 1k there, yeah, or whatever that is. Yeah, 1k. It's not marked particularly well, I must say. And you boost, and at first it's very subtle. I mean, you won't hear this on on the camera mic. But the more you boost, it gets peakier and peakier. You know. And I'll just sweep that EQ a bit. I'm going up there. There is a little buzz on there. I've got so many things cabled up and I've got a fluorescent lamp here and what have you. I'll sweep it back down. You know, it's, um, yeah. You know, the, the characteristic of the EQ is that, it, like I say, it doesn't jump out and go, Rah! you know. You just choose a frequency and boost it, uh, choose a frequency rather, and boost it with this or cut it and at first it's subtle and then the more you push it the peakier it gets, you know, it's it's pretty usable, I must say. Now for a live gig and things like that, this EQ is absolutely perfect, it's very good. Even in the studio, it's it's fine, general, musical, broad EQ. You know, if you want very specialist, corrective EQ, you would use an, an outboard EQ unit or, or software if you were using this in a MIDI studio with a sequencer and stuff, right? But it's good, very acceptable EQ, nice and smooth and I like it. And it's not radically different to anything you'd find from any other manufacturer, to be honest. <laughs> but it is, it is nice and smooth. So uh, that's the EQ section. And, um, and then if you move on to the auxiliaries. And um, they live below the EQ and they live on this background which is painted black. And as I said earlier, the whole board is finished in this gunmetal grey. And some bits are picked out in black and some in white. And, uh, and uh, I'm going to introduce a niggle now to this review, and that is that if I bring this lamp over, for the black painted background on this board, for some strange reason, Behringer have used gloss paint. Well, I can't quite figure that out. Anyway, it's very reflective. Um, now, look, in day-to-day, -day, everyday use, it, it's not intrusive, and I've tried setting this mixer up in a dark room with a little lamp over it, as you would at a local gig. Again, if you get the lamp at, a, at an angle, you can see everything, but it doesn't reflect badly. It, it, you get the place, the time that you get like more reflections is uh, like if it's in a well lit media studio, and if you bring some lamps over the top of the board, like as if it was on a well lit working area, then you do get these reflective spots from the black. Uh, so that's a little niggle, and I'd say to Behringer, look, you know. Um, the, in the production of these mixers, uh, the part in the factory where you have the metal panel and you silk screen these colours on before it goes to have the boards and everything fitted, just change the paint to like a matte black. Oh, that would be better in my opinion. Anyway, the auxiliaries live on this black painted background and there are two of them. Uh, rather, there are two pairs, right? So you have four auxiliaries in total. One, two, three, four. And the first two are labelled Auxiliary 1 and Auxiliary 2, and they are capped in red. Now they are fixed post-fade by default, but you can switch them both into pre-fade mode using this button that accompanies them here. Um, and for beginners, pre and post-fade means, OK, by default they're post-fade, which means if I turn up and send some signal out on these auxiliaries from this channel, if I then go down to the fader, Basically, the amount of level coming out of these two controls, if they're in post-fade, that is with the button up, follows the fader. So if I lower the fader, the signal coming out of here lowers proportionately to follow the fader level. Yeah? And you'd use them in post-mode if you were using them as effect sends to send to um, a reverb or a delay or something, because, say, a guitar was coming down this channel, and this was sending out to a reverb and a, and a delay. If you lowered that channel, you would want the delay and reverb to lower in volume as you lower the guitar. And that's how it will work if you leave them in post. But if you switch them into pre, that's pre-fader, which means the signal is being sent out 
before the fader, the fader level makes no difference at all. Whatever level you set to send out from these, if they switch to pre, it will remain fixed and constant no matter what you do with the fader. And you'd use them in pre-fade configuration um, in a live or studio situation, typically and classically auxiliaries in that situation in pre-fade mode are used to feed monitor um, rings or monitor chains that the musicians use to listen to when they're playing. In a live situation you will send signals out from the channels using these to feed the wedges along the front of the stage and things on, that the musicians listen to. And in a studio you'd use these to send a mix to musicians in, in the playing room. Okay. Anyway, that's what they do for beginners. And that's auxiliary 1 and 2. Now, the second pair of auxiliaries are labelled FX1 and FX2, and they're capped in this orange colour. <coughs> and uh, beginners might be wondering, well, why aren't they just called auxiliary 3 and auxiliary 4? And to be honest, that is what they are. They are auxiliary 3 and 4, but um, they've been labelled as, as uh, FX1 and FX2, and they've been capped in this colour to clearly show for beginners that they are hardwired to these two onboard effects processors over here. Okay. But, joy of joys, they also do work as traditional auxiliary sends. Now the more experienced users will, will love this. Um, basically I send some out from these uh, from effects send 1 and effects send 2. They're post fade by default so I will not have any signal coming out unless I raise the fader. So let's get that drum going, the drums going through it and raise these faders up and then I'll send a little bit out from this channel to the two effects processors. Right. And if I go over here to the two effects processors, the top left control on each unit works as an input level control, see? Yeah. But this also acts as the final master for the FX1 and FX2 bus routing out of their own dedicated FX send sockets up at the top here. So that is brilliant. I mean, so the beauty of this is is that you can use these as traditional auxiliaries or FX sends to send out to hardware FX units in the traditional way and then route them back into your mix. But you can also use them to send to these onboard effects units and you can do both at the same time. You could send signal out to two external effects processors and use the two onboard effects processors at the same time. So that's a real bonus actually and um, when you get into part two and I'll show you the routing outputs for these um, effects processors you'll see that there's, there's a lot of potential options and versatility uh, in what they can do. Uh, anyway, that is your auxiliaries, and uh, then we, we we go down the channel and we lose that dreaded shiny black painted background, and we're back to the default gunmetal grey again for this strip where all the pan controls live, and the pan controls are capped in black. <laughs> capped in black. <laughs> Uh, I don't mean Captain Black as in Captain Scarlet and the Mistrons, as in I am Captain Black and you will bow before the Mistrons and all that. I mean they are capped in a black colour. Uh, yeah. um, and uh, that's the channel controls and then we're into the fader area. And uh, the faders, whether they're the channel faders, the bus faders or the master faders, they're all 60mm faders. And all the faders live in this silvery white area. And um, they feel quite nice. They're nice and smooth. They have some resistance. Uh, they're not like really, really crappy, so they've like, got no resistance at all. They feel, in terms of the resistance and the, the smoothness, kind of like on a Soundcraft Ghost or something. Uh, I actually prefer a fader that's got more resistance, but that's just me. You know, that's just me. I'm used to working on uh, older boards and stuff or bigger boards and they have a slightly different feel sometimes um, but it's smooth it's nice they feel good and uh, accompanying the fader you have a bunch of buttons okay and some lamps and uh, what they do uh, for beginners is you've got a mute switch with a LED indicator and they're nice and silent in operation 
And uh, for that, by saying that, for beginners, I don't mean that I don't mean silent as in terms of the sound you can hear coming from the physical switch. What I mean is, if you've got music coming through a channel and you mute it, there's no click or pop. That if you listen carefully on headphones, right, the music just disappears when you mute it. And when you open it again, again, there is no click or pop. You just unmute it, and the the, the music is back. So they're nice and silent and very clean and they're nice. And they're a nice big size. And of course having mutes is great because it means you can use this uh, mixer for doing dub. You can actually mix dub on it live or in the studio and um, you can do live electronic gigs um, having a nice big easy to see mute button um, allows you to do live electronic gigs much easier and you can mute things and bring them in and out of the mix and control the mix kind of like how a DJ does, you know. Anyway. Mute switches and they all, every channel has them and they're good. And they have a little yellow, yellow LED lamp to show you that they're lit uh, or activated. And then below that there is this red LED which is titled with the legend clip but it also functions as the indicator lamp for the solo switch, right? Now the clip indicator, I've just got, I've got a kick drum coming in on this channel here. I will boost the bass on that channel. And you can see I've now made the channel clip. Okay, I'm just explaining this for beginners. Um, the input level here is flickering nicely. I'm getting a good nominal input. The EQ is flat, but as soon as I boost the bass EQ, I'm by boosting a frequency in an EQ section, you're increasing the overall volume of that signal, leaving the EQ, and hence I'm now overloading the channel. Uh, this clip indicator shows you that you're overloading the channel after the input gain. So look, if I boost all that bass really, really a lot, I'm getting heavy clipping here, but it hasn't increased how much this is flickering, because this is showing me that the channel is overloading after this input gain. Or, if I inserted a, um, a compressor or something in here and brought it back, it comes back in after the input gain, so if I've got this flat or whatever and I'm not clipping the channel and then I bring the insert back and it suddenly shows clipping then the output of my effects processor is too high. Okay, That's what this uh, clip indicator does. And as I say it functions as the uh, indicator lamp for the solo switch and uh, that sends this channel off in isolation to your monitor uh, output and also to the faders. Uh, or sorry to the meters, but we'll, we won't look at that now. We'll get, we'll get into that when we come to the bit the second part where we look at the master section because um, the metering is multifunction and it needs to be looked at in that way and kept all together. Okay, um, and then the only other buttons you've got are the routing buttons. And for beginners, this is these are the choices as to where this channel can be sent. You can send it to the main left right mix subgroup 1 and 2 over here or you can send it to subgroup 3 and 4 over here uh, or you can send it to all of them or any combination of them or none of them uh, and that's one fully featured channel um, over here the and there's 16 of those right with the mic inputs and then just to quickly look at these full length fixed stereo line channels again and the two mini line channels which are stereo as well Actually, last uh, eight channels arranged as four stereo line channels. Uh, the two full length ones, uh, they've got all the same features, but the gain is different because they're only going to have to uh, amplify line level input, so there's less input gain. The EQ is different. You get the same 12k top, cut or boost 15 dB. You get the same 80 hertz bass, cut or boost 15 dB. But instead of the sweep mid on the mic channels, you get instead a fixed high mid at 3k, which is cut or boost by 15 dB. You get a fixed low mid at 400 Hz, which is cut or boost by 15 dB. Uh, and everything else is the same. Oh, and there's, there's no low cut switch on these line input channels because that's a mic cut switch, so you don't need that. And um, the last two mini channels we looked at earlier, but just to show you that the two auxiliaries are fixed pre and they feed uh, you know, into the auxiliary 1 and 2 bus but they're fixed pre, they're not switchable like the ones over here there's a solo switch with an, an accompanying LED light and an input level and that's it now you can't route these to anywhere uh, you can send out from them into the auxiliary bus 
but they are by default hardwired into the main left right mix okay and that's it <coughs> pardon me and uh, the inputs for these uh, fixed stereo line channels are up here 1718 1920 2122 2324 and the left side of each pair is labeled mono if you wanted to bring a mono input into these stereo line channels you just plug into the left side and that's your lot that's your input channels and we've managed to get it covered in 37 minutes but that included a look at the Q curves and everything like that and I've explained things for beginners so I hope that's been useful um, yeah you know the input channels they're nice they the preamps are nice they've got tons of range British EQ with a pork pie and a bowler app um, you know but it's a it's just a very nice usable sweet mid EQ perfectly acceptable um, yeah very nice so now let's look at part two, which is the master section, including the routing and the effects processes, and this um, rather uh, interesting nine-band graphic with FBQ feedback detection. Okay, so uh, stay tuned and come back to watch that one, and hopefully this will be the take, because I've done this so many times I'm going mental. <laughs> um, okay, see you for part two.